Hello, students. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be finishing up our notes today and having kind of a modified little lab just to introduce us to some of the measurements that we typically take in a laboratory environment. So let's talk about lab measurements. First and foremost, we are scientists and therefore we use only one system of measurement. And what system of measurement is that, everyone? That's right. It is the metric system. Now, I emphasize this for a few reasons. Number one, it's just what we do as scientists. Uh, we scientists like to find the easy way of doing things, and the metric system is easy. And we've spoken before that the whole world uses the metric system, no matter what country you're in, including the U.S., if you are a scientist. So we want to use a common language. But as we also know, in the United States, you have grown up using a different system of measurement as well. And that may make things a little bit more challenging for you in the science lab in this country, because we're going to be using some different instruments. And in particular, one of the instruments that we're going to be using to measure length are rulers. And there are many different kinds of rulers, as we've already discussed. Many of the rulers that you will be using in your life here in the U.S. have both systems of measurement on them. So it's going to be really important for you to be able to identify which side of the ruler you're supposed to be using. If you look at these two examples right here on the screen, both of these rulers, just like some of the rulers you may be used to using in school, have both the USA units, and in this case, inches on the top, and the metric units on the other sign, in this case, the centimeters on the bottom. Now, when we get to the laboratory itself, I have rulers that are only metric rulers for you to use. And so the rulers we'll be using in the laboratory have millimeters on one side and centimeters on the other side. But when you're making measurements, be sure you are using the correct side of any ruler. So let's look at these two rulers on the screen, keeping in mind that we should only be using the metric system. There's a line here, a red line. And if you look closely at the line, thankfully the line is on the correct side of the ruler. We don't use the inches side. We're using the centimeter side of the ruler here. And if you uh, check out the arrow, you have to make sure it starts at the starting point of the ruler, not the edge of the ruler necessarily, necessarily, but the zero line of the measurements on the ruler. That's one of the easiest mistakes that you can correct. Make sure you start it on the zero line. Then, as you're measuring an object, in this case the red arrow, you see where it extends along the metric side of the ruler, in this case, centimeters. Now, one of the really, really cool things about the metric system is that it is a base 10 system. If you've got 10 fingers, you've already almost mastered the metric system because the metric system is a base 10. You don't have to remember funky numbers like we talked about yesterday, and you don't measure with fractions. If you're using the American system, you know, on this particular ruler, you know, you, you have one inch here, one half inch, one quarter inch, one eighth inch. Scientists don't bother with fractions. You don't need fractions in science class. We use a decimal system, which means all of the numbers on the ruler 
are decimal points. So all you have to do is be able to count to 10. So if you've got 10 fingers, you can measure in the metric system. Now, what do I exactly mean by this? Well, let's go back to this screen here and check it out. If you look at the length of this arrow on the white ruler, we have one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, but it's not quite four centimeters. It's between three and four centimeters. So how do we determine the exact length of this line? You count the little lines. The first little line beyond the three is one-tenth of a centimeter. So we call that 3.1. The next line is 3.2. Then 3.3, .3, followed by 3.4. And what do you think the next line is? <laughs> nice job. You can count. 3.5. This particular line simply measures 3.5 centimeters. If it was a little bit longer, it might be 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, So again, this is a decimal system. It makes measurement easy. All you have to do is count to 10. No fractions involved. Okay, so if you can handle length measurements, you're also going to be able to handle other kinds of measurements, such as measurements of volume. Now, you remember from yesterday, the tool we use to measure volume is a graduate or a graduated cylinder, and here's a picture of one. Now, most liquids, when you pour them into a graduate, will form a smiley face, a little curve inside the graduate because most liquids tend to be a little bit sticky and they stick to the edges of the graduated cylinder. We call that little curve or smiley face a meniscus. And you can be copying that down in your notes. Label the diagram like this in your, in your book and label that line a meniscus. And when you read the volume of a liquid in a graduate, you always want to look at the bottom of the meniscus. Meniscus is that curve. You look at the bottom of the smiley face and you want to line up your eyeball. You want to line up your eyeball so that it is level with the bottom of the meniscus. Now, another important thing to keep in mind is that your graduate must be placed on a level surface like your tabletop or your sink counter. Because if you're holding it at an angle, the meniscus is going to move. So if you look at this particular picture here of our eyeball looking straight at the level of the liquid inside the graduate, we're going to read this the same way we read a ruler. Here's the liquid, the gray part. Here is 40, and the, the units are milliliters, milliliters, or one thousandth of a liter. So this line here is 40 milliliters. This line here is 50 milliliters. Well, let's count the little lines in between, shall we? You can see the meniscus curves down. So we're looking at the bottom of the meniscus, which comes to this line. I wonder what the volume is. Let's see if you can figure this out. Here's 40. Here's 41. 42, and what do you think the volume of the liquid is inside? <laughs> nice job. You've like mastered the metric system in like five minutes. That's awesome. That's 43 milliliters. If it were more, it would be 
44 milliliters. This slightly longer line is halfway between 40 and 50. So it is 45 milliliters, 46, 47, 48, 49, and finally 50 milliliters. So you read a graduate basically the same way you read a ruler. Uh, and remember, it is in the decimal system, so you're never using fractions. Now, there is another way of uh, determining the volume of objects, and it's called the displacement method. You use this method in sixth grade when you are studying geology and you might determine the, the volume of a mineral that's small enough to fit into a graduate. You can use it, actually eighth grade, we're going to be using it next week to determine the volume of an irregularly shaped object by placing it into a graduate filled with a liquid. And when you place a liquid into a graduate, you can measure its volume as we just did. And if you place an object into that liquid, into the graduate here, what do you think is going to happen to that liquid level? What do you think? Say it out loud. What do you think? Yeah, it's going to go up. Just like if you get into a bathtub, the water level is going to rise. And that is called the displacement method. And if you measure the volume before and after you place an object in a graduate, difference between the two is the exact volume of that object. So that is the, uh, the displacement method of determining volume. All right, let's continue here. And there's some really inf important information. In your book, you, you'll want to make a note of this. We measure volume a little bit differently when it comes to solids and liquids. Now, I'm going to point out to you a really awesome thing about the metric system. But first, I want you to write down that solids, we measure volume with the units cubic centimeters, and we measure liquids with the unit milliliters. And I am now going to show you why. So let's go to the, to the lab here for a moment, and I'm going to discuss for you uh, how and why we use different units for solids compared to liquids. So let's begin with a, an object here, a solid object. I have a solid object. This is a block. It's a regularly shaped object, and it is three-dimensional. And if you look at it, hopefully you can see there's lots of lines on it. And these lines are all measured and we could prove it with a ruler here. If we take this ruler to our object, you'll see that all of those lines are one centimeter apart. So we've got a block here that measures 10 centimeters, and it's a perfect cube. So it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Now, if we were to determine the area of one side of this cube, it would be 10 times 10. And what is 10 times 10, everyone? Most of you got it. Yeah, it's 100. The area of one side of this cube is 100 square centimeters. But this is three-dimensional, so let's add that third dimension in. So what is 10 times 10 times 10. We know that 10 times 10 is 100. So what's 100 times 10 more? We just add another zero when we're multiplying by 10. So what's 100 with another zero? Let me hear you say it. Excellent. 1,000. Now, what does that mean? It means that this block is 1,000 thousand cubic centimeters. Okay, fine, but what does this have to do with volume? Well, this is a solid block. This is a solid block, and, and we could measure the volume of this, and we use cubic centimeters. But you want to hear something really cool? Check this out. If this block were hollow, like this cube here, 
which is hollow. And we filled this 1,000 cubic cube, that's hollow, 1,000 cubic centimeter cube, and we filled it with a liquid, say water. Well, how much water would we have? Well, if we had a large enough graduate, we could pour that water into a graduate and measure it, and it would be 1,000 milliliters. Now, now, now think about this for a moment. 1,000 cubic centimeters with this cube is equal to 1,000 milliliters of liquid volume. 1,000 equals 1,000. That is a remarkable thing about the metric system, and it was designed this way because, well, let's take it a little bit further. If we were to take this, this cube and break it into a 1,000 little cubes, each cube would look like this. Each cube would be about this big. This is one cubic centimeter. Well, if we take one cubic centimeter, and if it were hollow and we filled it up with water, we know that one cubic centimeter is one thousandth of a thousand cubic centimeters. So what do you think if this were hollow, we filled it with water, what do you think the volume would be if it were one thousandth of a liter? What prefix would you use to indicate one thousandth of a liter? Think about it for a moment, then yell out your answer. Milli, that's right. If this were hollow, this one cubic centimeter of a solid would be equal to one milliliter of a liquid. It is a beautiful connection in the metric system. One equals one. But get a load of this. If we were to take that one milliliter of water, which is one cubic centimeter of water, and we put it on a balance and measure its mass, guess what its mass is? One gram. In other words, one equals one equals one in the metric system. It's all connected. One cubic centimeter equals one milliliter equals one gram. It's beautiful. It, to show you how beautiful that is in the metric system, think about the units that you're familiar with. Can you tell me how many pounds are in a gallon? Or how many inches are in, say, uh, uh, a quart? They seem like nonsensical questions because, well, they are nonsensical questions in the standard system that we use here, but not in the metric system. One cubic centimeter equals one milliliter equals one gram of water. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love the metric system. All you have to do is be able to count to 10 and you've got it made and no funky numbers to remember. One equals one equals one. It's beautiful. All right, let's get back to our notes. All right. So, so when you're measuring solids, we measure it in cubic centimeters, so we know it's a solid. When we measure in for liquids, we measure it in milliliters. But remember that when we're talking about water in particular, which is the standard in the metric system, one cubic centimeter equals one milliliter. Again, it is a beautiful thing. All right, now, how about mass? Well, we're going to be using 
Do you remember what we're going to use to measure mass in science? Here's a picture of one. In fact, why don't you take a moment, yell out what you think this is called. <laughs> some of you said scale. Some of you said balance. Let's see. Uh, first, this is a, uh, the first one I showed you was a digital one. This is a double pan one, but they're both balances. Balances are used to measure mass. Scales measure weight. There is a difference between mass and weight. Weight is a measure of the force of gravity pulling down an, on an object, and it changes from one place to another. We'll talk more about that later. Mass doesn't change from one place to another. Your mass is your mass, whether you are in space or here on Earth. So a balance measures mass, a scale measures weight. Now, as far as science here this year is concerned, scales aren't going to be pretty things for many of the labs we're doing because we're going to want to measure mass. There will be times when we use them. But here is an example of a bathroom scale. And look at the lovely feet there. No, this is not a self-portrait. Those are not my feet, okay? This is a bathroom scale. You stand on a scale to measure your weight. We, we don't normally stand on a balance, but balance, a balance is used to measure mass. And when we use double pan balances like this one showed here, we always place the object on the left-hand side, and I'll show that to you in just a few minutes. But before we do, let's move on quickly to temperature. Temperature also in the metric system, it is a base 10 system, so it's really easy to determine the temperature in the metric system. Here's a thermometer, and if we get a close-up view of this thermometer, and we check out the temperature at this line, we look at liquid inside the thermometer and we look at the lines and the labels on the lines to determine what the temperature in degrees Celsius is. Well, this big long line here is 30. This one up here is 40. And the one halfway between, as you could probably guess, is 35. So let's look at this picture here and see if you can tell me what do you think the temperature is illustrated on this thermometer? Here's 30. What do you think this one is? Say it out loud. And therefore, what do you think the temperature is on this thermometer? Say it loud and proud. What do you think? If you said 32, good for you, because 32 is the correct temperature according to this thermometer. So nice job. All right, let's move on. You have been finishing up your notes currently uh, for your book, but uh, on the bottom of that page, I'd like you to write four words. And these four words are going to be our lab activity for today. The four words I would like you to write include length, volume, mass, and temperature. Length, volume, mass, and temperature. Take a moment to write those four words on the bottom of the page of page 23 in your book. And then I'm going to give you a close-up view of some of these measurements we have made and I'm going to allow you to determine the answer to the questions I'm about to give you. So once you have that written down, I'm going to head over to the lab and a close-up view in the lab here, and I'm going to try to quiz you. First, I'm going to move some of these things out of the way. <laughs> By the way, I used this block to illustrate with you earlier. It's a good thing I didn't use this block, huh? 
<laughs> this block is green. Isn't that cool? Uh, check it out. Oh, I'm a blockhead. <laughs> All right. Anyway, you can have lots of fun stuff with uh, with green screens. Uh, but right now, let's get back on track. Okay. So first, let's begin with length and measuring length using a ruler. I have a block here. I have a block. It's a little Lego block. And we're going to measure the length. You are going to measure the length of this block using this ruler. And I'm not going to trick you at all. This is a metric ruler. You can see it is centimeters on one side, millimeters on the other side. We are going to use the centimeter side. And I'm going to take this block and put it behind the ruler, matching it up. And here, I'm going to hold it up so you can see it a little bit better. I'm going to give you a moment to determine the length of this block. Let me just get a good angle here. Here we go. I think that's a good angle. I think you can see that if I hold it nice and still. I'd like you to measure the length of this block and write it down in your book. And be sure to use appropriate decimals. Remember, no fractions in the metric system. So that is your lab measurement for length. Okay, I think you've had enough time. Now let's move to the next one, which is volume. I have a beaker here. This is a two-part question. I'm going to give you an easy one and a more difficult one. So in the first space for volume, since it is rather difficult to see with the green screen and these and the uh, the instruments that I'm using here, this is a beaker, and I want you to see if you can tell what the volume is in this beaker. And I think that might give you ah yeah there you go. Here's a good view of this beaker and the. Units here are milliliters, so record the volume of this beaker in milliliters. Don't think about this one too much. I'm making it real easy here for you. Okay, next to that, let's see if I can challenge you a little bit because this one's a little bit more difficult to see. But here is a, a tiny graduate. And I've got a certain volume of liquid in here, and I'm not sure whether it's easier to see with a white background or a see-through. Actually, that's pretty good. I'm going to give you a moment to see if you can determine what the volume is in this small graduate. Take a moment and write it down. We'll talk about it later, so don't worry if you got it wrong. So that is volume. Very good. Very good. All right. The next one on your list is mass. So let me show you a double pan balance. I think we can see this pretty well. There we go. Let me show you how a double pan balance works. It's called a double pan balance because it's got two pans. One on the left and one on the right. I'm just looking for my little object here that I was going to determine the mass of, but I can't locate it. It seems to have rolled away on me. So we'll improvise and we'll use something else. Hey, why don't we use the Lego block? So we're going to determine the mass of the Lego block here, and I'm going to show you how to use the double pan balance. First, these are called riders. You want to move them all the way over to the left. Up top is the balancing needle. You want to make sure that that needle is right on the line. That way it is balanced. You place your object on the left side of the balance and notice it's no longer balanced. Oh no, what happened? Well, we're, we're measuring the mass of something. So you can take a pen, pencil, your finger, or a small object and slowly move the top rider over 
until you observe the needle moving closer to the center line. Uh-oh, it hasn't moved yet. That means, and if you look at these numbers here, this goes up to 10 grams. So the object must be more than 10 grams. So we move the bottom rider and click it into position to 10. Still is in balance, so we move the rider over again. And we do that, uh-oh, we went too far. The needle went beyond the line. So we go back, back a little further. Ooh, wee, we're getting close, getting close. And it looks like the needle is right on the balancing line. So the way we measure uh, and read the double pan balance is by adding these numbers together. So here we have 10, here we have one, so what is 10 plus 1? What's 10 plus 1, everybody? 11. And now let's count the little lines. This is 11.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20
All right, we'll do those kinds of things when we get back into the lab. But for now, work on the top third, the top section of page 20. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And uh, that's it for today. I would like you to, uh, oops, I would like you to, uh, to finish up your work. And I'm also going to be providing you a link to the practice quiz for tomorrow's quiz. So be sure to take the practice quiz for tomorrow's real quiz. Remember your one-stop shopping location, Google Classroom. Check it out. Bye-bye.